It's well, extru- Have you ever heard of The Butcher of Plainfield? No, I have not. Oh, that sounds really cool, though. Wait, did he take people's faces and wear them like a face mask? Yes. Well, okay, all right, let me take it off. I'm sorry. I couldn't breathe in there anyway, I'll be honest. What did it smell like? Awful. Pig. Edward Theodore Gain was born August 27, 1906, in La Crosse County, Wisconsin. He grew up isolated on a 155-acre farm with his alcoholic father, George, controlling mother, Augusta, and his brother, Henry. As a child, Ed only left the farm to attend school. Augusta, his mother, was always turning away outsiders in fear of bad influences for her sons. Yeah, it seems like a very uh, restricted upbringing. Correct. She was very religious, Lutheran, and was always preaching to her boys about the immorality of the world, the evils of drinking, and her belief that all women, except her, of course, are were naturally prostitutes and instruments of the devil. All but her? <laughs> all women but her. <laughs> wow. She read the Bible to her boys every afternoon, usually selecting graphic verses from the Old Testament concerning death, murder, and divine retribution. Yeah, because that's the craziest, <coughs> most spooky shit. Most bestest part of the Bible. Yeah. Kids love hearing that shit. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. Keeps you up at night. Don't you know? Oh, you Don't know. you know? Listen here, Ed and Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember that all women are sluts. <laughs> They're all prostitutes, They're huh? all prostitutes, yeah. <laughs> Though he did well in school, Ed was remembered by old classmates as odd. Seemingly random laughter, like he was telling himself jokes. Mm-hmm. Unsurprisingly, he had very poor social development, as his mother would apparently punish him if he tried to make friends. In 1940, Ed's father died of heart failure caused by alcoholism. Mm. And Ed and Henry... Shit, you can die from that? Yeah. Yes, you can. Bullshit. And Ed and Henry had to start doing odd jobs around town to help make ends meet. In 1940? Yes. So he is 34 years old. They have to start working for the first time in their lives? Uh, yeah, they owned a farm. I don't really know what they it did. They were very isolated. <laughs> okay. It's Wisconsin. 150-acre farm. 155 acre farm. Well, there you go. There you go. Those five acres that really made the farm. Yep. It's a widow maker. Oh. <laughs> Henry, his brother, met a woman around this time and began to move on with his life. This was when Henry started to make comments about Ed's weird attachment to their toxic mother, and Ed did not agree with him and was very hurt that Henry talked about her like that. Ugh. In 1944, only four years after their father died, Ed and Henry were burning marsh vegetation and the fire got out of control. The fire department showed up and contained the flames, but Henry was missing. They found him face down and realized he had been dead for a while. Unrelated to the fire, with no burns or apparent injuries, it was thought that he died from heart failure. There was a report that there were bruises to his head that thought that maybe he had been battered. Ooh. But he, that he, and then they thought heart failure, but they actually thought more asphyxiation. Oh, okay. So he was Which maybe could, strangled or strangled, or if you're in the fire, he might yeah right lose oxygen. Oh, right. So it's kind of hard to say. But he was dead for a while. Yes, he was dead for a while, but he wasn't burned by any fire or anything like that. Hmm. With his brother and father dead, Ed's mother Augusta was the only one left in his family and his life. Augusta suffered a paralyzing stroke in that same year that Henry died, and Ed based his whole life around caring for his mother. She had a second stroke and died of complications at the end of 1945. So from 1940 to 1945, this guy lost his dad, his brother, and his mother. Damn. So no social skills, taught to hate women Ed, lost his entire immediate family. Yeah, but everything's cool. Yeah, it's all good. No, well, I'm fine. I'm doing fine. Yeah, but lost this entire family that he was built up around. He couldn't really leave. He couldn't socialize. So his Correct. entire universe is gone. Ed had inherited this farm and continued to earn money from odd jobs and babysitting. Which really? Is super strange. Right. It was said that he boarded up the rooms used by his mother. So upstairs, the downstairs parlor, and the living room. These rooms were made pristine while the rest of the rooms in the house became filthy. He lived in a room off of the kitchen, reading books about cannibalism and Nazism. So this is, this is right. So his, his mother died like right at the end of World War II. Right. right. 
so he's reading books about cannibalism and Nazism. Kicking back. Just kicking back. Were Everyone's these, dead in his family. Were these rooms like boarded up like from the outside? Like it was obvious, like, what you doing here, Patrick? No, they. I think they're boarded up from the inside. So okay. the whole house looked normal, but oh. you couldn't access those rooms from the inside. They remained pristine. That's crazy. He received a farm subsidy from the federal government in 1951 and would occasionally work for the local municipal road crew and crop threshing crews in the area. On the morning of November 16th, 1957, Bernice Warden went missing from her hardware store in Plainfield. The cash register was gone, and there was a trail of blood leading out of the back. A witness had seen the store truck being driven away that morning around 9.30 in the morning. The store was closed that day, so it was suspected oh that God. something had happened the night before. Bernice Warden's son, who happened to be Deputy Sheriff Frank Warden told investigators that Ed Gein had been in the store the night before. This is based on receipts. Ed was arrested at a grocery store, and authorities went to Ed's farm to search his property. When they walked into a shed on his property, they found Bernice Warden's corpse. Oh, my God. She had been decapitated. Mm. Her headless body hung upside down by means of ropes at her wrists and a crossbar at her ankles. So someone who kind of like knew anatomy or some kind yes. of... Well, it was also around deer hunting season. Uh, and this is Wisconsin, so I'm sure everybody knew how to hang up an animal. And dress and, it and, as and, it Yes, were. exactly. Most horribly, the body's trunk was empty. The rib cage split and the body dressed out like that of a deer. Mm. These mutilations had been performed post-mortem, which is after death. She had been shot at close range with a 22 caliber rifle. Upon further searching the house, they found even more disturbing sights. Sights so disturbing that gave him the name The Butcher of Plainfield. Like just like mismatching carpets. And- yeah. Right there, this, I would hear that yes. beep. You know, like he had an really old terrible, He had really terrible interior design skills. It was awful feng shui. He had so many curry cups. They're so wasteful. <laughs> and bad for the environment. That's ah. just rude. He doesn't recycle. The Butcher of Plainfield. <laughs> He's a maniac. This is just a list of things that they found in this guy's house. Whole human bones and fragments. A wastebasket made of human skin. Oh. Human skin covering several chair seats. Something. Like upholstered. Upholstered oh, right. with, with human skin. Skulls on his bedposts. Female skulls, some with tops that were sawn off. Hmm. Bowls made from human skulls. That he would actually eat out of, correct? Mm-hmm. Cereal. Oh, oh yeah, cereal. Lucky Charms it? That, just right out it? of a skull. Didn't the police find an actually uh, human skull that had cereal in it still? I don't know. It depends on how like fastidious he was. Uh, right. I don't know if he did the dishes all the time. <laughs> I'm guessing not. He was a very good roommate. Very clean. Yeah. They found the, one bowl. That's my pasta skull. That's my cereal skull. Don't get it mixed up. Insta skull. A corset made from a female torso, skin from shoulders to waist. Uh, like an actual human. Leggings made from human leg skin. Masks made from the skin of female heads. Uh-huh. This entire, he had a full body suit. People suit. People suit. <laughs> Mary Hogan's, I'll go over her in a second. Mary Hogan's skull in a box. Mm. Mary Hogan's face mask in a paper bag. Bernice Wardens, who this is the woman that they were looking for, entire head in a burlap sack. Bernice Warden's heart in a plastic bag in front of his potbelly stove. Hmm. Nine vulvae in a shoebox. Vulvae. I never knew uh, a young vulvae. girl's dress and the vulvas of two females judged to have been about 15 years old. Oof. Uh, God damn a it. belt made from female human nipples. That's one thing I have heard about. That's so metal. Jesus. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I would say like Norwegian really, black metal. Yeah. Really messed up, but also metal, yeah. Four noses. This is like the worst version of the 12 Days of Christmas ever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. Five nipple belts, four noses, three painted vulvas, two, two vulvas. And a pair of lips on a window shade drawstring. Oh, wow. Points. 
<laughs> is that for real? Yep. Wow, that is, that's perfect. She shoots, she scores. Wow, that oh. is amazing. And a lampshade made from the skin of a human face. I have heard of that one. And fingernails from fing- female fingers. This this is some like a uh, really in depth kind of shit. Now, so, multiple people, right? Let it be known mm-hmm. that this guy only killed two people. This yes. is a lot of body parts. So, when questioned, Ed told investigators that between 1947 and 1952, so his mother died in 1945. Right. So about two years later, he was like, let me go crazy. College years. He made about 40 visits to three local graveyards at night to exhume recently buried bodies while he was in a, quote, days-like state. On about 30 of those visits, he said he came out of the days and will return home empty-handed. But on the other nine occasions, right. <laughs> he dug up graves of recently buried middle-aged women he thought resembled his mother Whoa. Right. and took the bodies home where he tanned their skins to make his trophies. Now, Ugh. I have to interject. Did he make relations with these recently buried bodies? Good question. He did not because they smelled too bad. He, those nine were like the supermarket spree of the graveyard, and he's like got two minutes to get his cart full of as many different dangle body parts he could, and uh, dangle. open his Etsy shop online. Basically, he missed his mom, so he began to create a woman suit <sniffs> that he could become his mother to literally crawl into her skin. Oh. Uh. And during state crime laboratory interrogation, Ed also admitted to the shooting death of Mary Hogan. I had mentioned her before that mm-hmm. her head was found mm-hmm. and her skull was in a box. She had been missing in 1954. She worked at a tavern, which happened to be a tavern that he frequented. So at some point in 1954, he had killed her and brought her to his house. That's so rude. And he was found in what year was 1957. it? 1957. Oh, so this is November 16th, 1957 wow. was when Bernice Warden was killed. Ed's most notorious creations were an array of shrunken heads. Neighborhood children... Remember, whom he babysat, because he used to babysit children, had seen or heard of these objects, which he casually described as relics from the South Seas sent by a cousin who had served in World War II. Upon investigation, these turned out to be human facial skins carefully peeled from cadavers used by Ed as masks. Uh, It's playtime, kitties! But did he really have a cousin who served in... I don't think so. No, I, uh... He didn't talk to anybody. He only had his immediate family. He yeah. pulled a real Pippi Longstocking Yeah, there. he did. Yeah. While Ed was in detention, his house burned down and arson was suspected. In 1958, the car which he used to haul the bodies of his victims was sold at public auction for $760 to an enterprising carnival sideshow operator named Bunny Gibbons. Gibbons. Gibbons called his attraction the Ed Gein Ghoul Car and charged oh, carnival yes. goers 25 cents admissions to see it. I have, heard of, I have heard of the Ed Gein Ghoul Car, and that is the best sounding attraction I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> band name? I was going to say, yes. Totally, 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 band, totally band, name. band name. Ed Gein was found mentally incompetent and unfit to stand trial at the time of his arrest and was sent to the Central State Hospital, now the Dodge Correctional Institution, in Wapen, Wisconsin. When the hospital was turned into the prison, he was transferred to Men- Mendota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. In 1968, Ed's doctors determined he was sane enough to stand trial. Oh, wow. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity by, ju- by Judge Robert H. Golmar and spent the rest of his life in the hospital. On July 26, 1984, Ed Gein died of respiratory and heart failure due to cancer in Goodland Hall at the Mendota Mental Health Institute. After his death, his gravestone was frequently vandalized. Wonder why? That is the Butcher of Plainfield. That is amazing. Absolutely incredible. Man, Ed Gein Gulkart. <laughs> 